Welcome to Long Haul, y'all. My name's Andrew. With me today is Mr. Shane Sisk. How are uh, you, Shane? Doing well. How's everybody doing? What? I, I said, how's everybody doing? <laughs> I was like, what did you what just did, say? What did you think I said? I had no idea what okay. you were Okay, try that again. No. Hey, we're hey, so I'm glad. Doing well. How are you? <laughs> we're so glad you are here this evening uh, here at Long Hollow. Hey, if this is your first time here, if you've never been here before, maybe this is your first time joining us online. Man, we are so thankful you came to worship with us, and we hope you have just an impactful evening with us as you hear an amazing story of what God has done in our pastor's life. But again, if you're new here, man, we'd love to connect with you, and we even have a gift for you. So if you can get out your phone and text the word NEW to the number 98173, man, we would love to connect with you. We'd love to get you that gift. And Shane, if they're here on campus and they want to meet somebody in person, where can they come? They can come to our information center. Uh, which is right back this way. That's right. Or they could find a new here table, and we've got some amazing volunteers at our new here tables who would love to connect with you and also have a gift for you. That's right. Well, tonight, which that's different, saying I know. tonight. That's very hard not to say morning. Right? That's right. Tonight, Pastor is sharing his personal testimony about how he went from a drug addict and drug dealer to the pastor here at Long Hollow. And so we would love for every one of you to share this service. You never know what God can do when you share this service. And all you have to do is hit the share button on your social media, or you can click on the QR code and copy the link and send that to your friends and they'll be able to watch it. Yeah, Shane is so cool because from all the morning services, I've already heard stories of life change, people surrendering their life to Jesus, all because you shared. So thank you for doing that. Seriously, God's up to something. Okay, so speaking of pastor's testimony, uh, we have a ministry here at Long Hollow we want to be sure you know about. It. It's called Celebrate Recovery. So internally, we shorten it to CR, uh, but CR is just an unbelievable ministry. I know Shane and I, we were talking earlier, it is like you go and it is one of those places Places, you just find the most real, genuine people. Real and genuine are the, are the key words. It, yeah. it is. You walk in the room, and from the moment worship starts, you just... Yeah. There's a whole different feeling. Yeah, there. for sure, for sure. So uh, so no matter what hurt, habit, or hang-up you may have, Celebrate Recovery is a great place to go get connected, uh, get connected with like-minded believers who have likely been through a lot of the same things you have been through and have seen God, you know, bring them to a new area of life. So if that's something you're interested in, I want to encourage you to text the letter CR to 981 Seven, three. Now, if you're not local and you're watching from somewhere else, you can still text that number. And if you scroll to the bottom, you're actually going to find a spot where you can put in your location and it will bring up all the Celebrate Recoveries that are in your local area. So highly encourage you to check that out, man. God's doing something amazing through that ministry. Uh, so check that out by texting CR to 98173. We also have a student version of right. CR, which is called The Landing. Uh, it meets on Mondays yeah. uh, over in the student building. And so if your student uh, is just struggling and just needs to find a place to connect, uh, The Landing would be a great place for them yeah. to be. Well, I'm glad you said that. So if you're here tonight, man, we'd love to see you tomorrow night at the same time. That's so, right. That's right. Celebrate Recovery or The Landing. Okay, so speaking of, you said middle school, high school, summer's right around the corner. I know it's kind of a crazy time. What for, do we need to know? Well, for us, I, my, my family schedules are jam-packed. Uh, yes, I can. And so to be able to see what's going on in our student ministry, in our kids' ministry, we thought that would be a great idea to help right. you out. And so if you'll uh, text SCHEDULE to 98173, you can get a full schedule of the kids' and student ministry schedule. Also, you'll be able to register for KidsCon. You can also sign up for middle school camp, high school camp, and kids camp. Ooh, let's go. And today through the 15th, uh -huh. you get the early bird special. Ooh, okay, so I remember last summer, many of these camps sold out. And there, I mean, I'm my my kids like slid in there. But they did. We so. you, we had to turn some kids <laughs> yeah, away. Yeah. And we hate that. Yeah. And it's not because we don't like them or like you. Uh, we just don't have any more <laughs> we spots. We want to make that clear. We, yeah. yeah. We like y'all. We like everybody. Uh, but we just ran out of room. Yeah. Okay. So if you text schedule to nine eight one seven three, not only can you see the list of all the things coming up in family ministry this summer, but you can go ahead and get signed up, and it's the best time to save money. That's right. Big deal. You know what I'm saying? That's right. So awesome. Okay, Shane. I have one more thing I need to tell you about. All right. I'm not supposed to tell you about this. All right. Are we, you sure you want to share it right here with everybody listening? Share it right here. Okay. We got secret church coming up. Shh. 
<laughs> secret church. Okay, so it's called Secret Church, but it's no secret. So here's the thing. Uh, if you've heard of Pastor David Platt, he's a mentor to Pastor Robbie. Uh, and every year he does something called Secret Church, which is this deep dive, this very deep Bible study. It'll last for a couple hours. Uh, this year he's going through the book of Ruth. And every year I've been through it, I just leave so impacted by God's word and studying it in an in-depth way in that fashion. So if you want, we're actually going to host a watch party for that. Uh, it's going to be a great time. We have a special thing for our students that night. So if you want to text SECRET to 98173, you can get the date, you can get the time, you can register your spot now. It's going to be a fun night. All right. Once again, if you are just now finding your seat or you're just now joining us online, uh, we would love to know if it's your first time here. So if you'll text the word NEW to 98173, we just love to contact you, find out your story, and we also have a gift for you. So text NEW to 98173. Okay, so here in a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to worship together. We're going to hear a message out of God's Word. Pastor's going to share his testimony. I'm so excited to see what God is going to continue to do tonight here at Long Hollow. Shane, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, well, if you can, let's stand together and let's worship. Good evening, Long Hall. It's good to see you tonight. Come on, let's worship together. You call 
is my shepherd and he is everything I need. So I will not worry, I will not fear the enemy. He said that he loves me, he said that he's with me, even though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, and still I know he has good plans, he has good plans for me. So I will take heart in deserts and gardens. He has good plans. He has good plans for me. If I know my Father, I know my Father has good plans. We can trust you, Jesus. Oh, I trust you. The Lord is my Savior, so why should I doubt my victory? Why would I question the rod and the staff that comforts me? He quiets the waters, He quiets the storm inside of me, so what could be better?
Somebody say, praise Jesus. Say, praise Jesus. Somebody say, he sees me. He knows me. He has plans for me. You know, I think somebody needs to hear that this evening and we lean in tonight, we're worshiping and God has plans for each and every single one of us in here. So I don't know where you came from or how you're feeling tonight, but God sees you and God loves you and so do we and we're so glad that you're here. You guys can have a seat. My name is Will and I have the honor and privilege of serving as a men's pastor here and if this is your first time here, I wanna say welcome. Over the last few weeks, we've had uh, a ton of new families that are joining us and maybe that's you. We would love to know who you are, and it's very simple, very easy to do that. You can text the word NEXT to 98173, and maybe you've been coming for a long time, and Long Hollow has been your home, and you've got questions on how uh, to join the church, or how to serve, or join a D group. You know, if you text the word NEXT to 98173, you'll get an opportunity to click on a few options, and those are questions that we can help answer for you. And so, do me a favor, scan that QR code, or text that number for us, and we'll do our best to help answer those questions, but if you are here in person, this is your first time, do me a favor and stop by our information center because we can help answer some of those questions potentially in person, and then we have a free gift we would love to give you. You know, last week was our Easter weekend, Easter 2024 for me personally, we'll go down in the history books as a weekend that I'll never forget. We saw God do some amazing things, some incredible things, and you'll hear a little bit more about that next week when Pastor gives our, our vision on Vision Sunday. But maybe you heard about our Easter offering that we were taking up. You know, if you're like me, I kind of, uh, I may or may not have forgot to, uh, to do that. Uh, so maybe that's you. Maybe uh, you forgot to do some, give to the Easter offering. We want to give you an opportunity today to participate in that. Uh, and I did go home and text the word give to 98173 uh, to make sure I did that. My wife reminded me. Uh, but I want to remind us what it's going to. Because one of the things that we want to make sure is that when you give to Long Hollow, you don't give to Long Hollow, you give what? You give through Long Hollow because we wanna be a church that is sensitive to what God wants and what God wants to do in and through our giving and how we worship in that way. And so one of the things that, um, that our Easter offering will go towards is our heart is to plant a Long Hollow campus in prisons, in every prison across the nation. And God is already doing that. It's unbelievable what God is doing. Well, we had um, pastors share here in a little bit what we saw even today and what God is opening up the doors. And so that's one of the ways the second thing is we're gonna partner with 12 local ministries in Sumner County to help fight hunger right here in our back door in Sumner County. So that's the second thing that'll go to. And then lastly, we're gonna partner with our family ministry and help provide scholarships for kids and students to participate in like things like camp or other opportunities throughout the year where they wouldn't otherwise be able to because of finances. And so those are the three initiatives that we prayed and feel like the Lord is leading us to. So when you give, just know that that is where that money is going to go towards. Well, today is a very special day. Uh, we've been waiting for this moment where we get to hear the story of redemption. We get to hear the story of recovery. But most importantly, we get to hear the story of Jesus Christ stepping into somebody's life right where they are, meeting them there, and saving their life. And so we're gonna hear from Pastor and his testimony. But I think it's fitting. I'm gonna invite Candy to come up. And, um, you know, Candy has seen a lot. She's been through a lot with Pastor. And uh, you've, been, you've been a part of his story for, for a while now. And it's incredible to see that 21 years ago, God stepped in and saved him. And so I think it's fitting for you to pray over him. But also, would you do us a favor? Would you pray over our offering and pray over our service tonight? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for just this time. We can come together um, tonight and just worship you and to hear a story in a man's life of how you worked mightily, Lord. Um, so I pray that you would speak to Robbie, speak through him, anoint him. Lord, uh, may we hear your words through him tonight. Um, every single one of us in here, we all have situations and problems in our life that only you're the answer to. And so I pray that you meet each and every person exactly where they are tonight, Lord, um, that you would speak to their heart, that you would comfort them, you would encourage them, you would convict them if need be, Lord, and that you would draw people closer to you um, through this testimony that we're going to hear. We love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for all that you do. We thank you for dying on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I look at this picture, I just see sadness. Just somebody who just really has 
no life in him. I see someone who's hopeless, who has nowhere to turn to. Who only cares about one thing, and that's when he's going to get his next fix. Well, I see you're gonna look at the picture. Uh, I see one that's just about destroyed himself. You know, total 180 from what he was. Total 180 from our expectations of what I thought he was gonna be. It's the most disheartening thing that you can imagine. He had his whole life in his hands and graduated from college, had a wonderful future, and just, it was all gone, all gone. It's so crazy because seeing this, it's like, this is not the person I know. This person is completely foreign to me. And so it's crazy to go back and think, that this was ever even once, Robbie. I just thought that he had so many accolades that, you know, why would God give him all these gifts and then just take them away? And all we did was pray and pray and pray. We weren't even saved back then, but we knew how to pray. This Robbie, um, when I think about it, you know, thank goodness I didn't know him well then, because there was that period where he kind of addiction set in. Um, and, and when that set in, um, it, it robbed him, it robbed, you know, uh, Mama Margaret, it robbed Bob, uh, Lori, me, it robbed so many of us of him, you know. Um, but it, that's not how the story was gonna end. Yeah, I think if I could go back and sit down with this Robbie, I would tell him that he is so loved and that there is so much value and worth in him and his life. He just doesn't feel it or know it yet. Never in your wildest dreams can you even imagine how God is going to use this struggle in your life to speak to so many other people and to bring them to the Lord and change their lives. And in the meantime, guess what? You're gonna lead me and mom and dad to our salvation. In a way, I would probably try to think of a way that I could tell him that what you are now is not gonna define your future. Um, it's gonna, God's gonna use it, you know, but it ain't gonna define it. It's all about God because he could not have done those things in himself. None of us can. And it's like you just go back and you think, what God can do in a person's life, you know, and that God pursued Robbie. He loves to chase us down, you know, no matter how much we're rebelling and um, no matter how much we just don't see the value and the worth in ourselves, you know, God would love nothing more than to reach down and touch those people, you know? We need God to help us in this. It's gonna be a long road up ahead in front of you. There's gonna be good times and there's gonna be bad times. I know God, God will get us through this. Um, don't be discouraged. Satan sometimes, things can happen, and, and we think Satan is one, but God can use those things in the end, you know, against him. God can take those things and completely turn around. Even when you think it's, you know, there's no way someone can come back from something. Uh, you know, you had a friend that was, you know, more lively than anything, and now he's this, you know. God can take all those things and make them new. If, if you knew what was in store for you, you would not believe it. Um, praise God, I'm, I'm so proud of you now. God really worked in your life when times we didn't think you would get through. 
You know, I've always said to Robbie, from the moment we met, he has always been the best example of Jesus to me. And I really mean that. God is good. Real good. Thank you, Jesus. You give God a chance, you never know what he will do. I said this morning, I probably should have showed that video after I preached. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. This is a special day for, for me personally, obviously, to, to be able to share my story. And, um, you know, as I was talking to my parents about the video, what, what I think is so emotional for all of us is that they remember who I was. And if you ever have a front row seat to addiction, um, it doesn't always turn out well. Uh, what I want to do today is, is, is do something different than I than I normally uh, do. Uh, normally I'll take a text and we'll share a sermon from a text, but uh, today, and we'll get back to Revelation. So if you're wondering, we'll, we'll eventually get back to that. But today I wanna share uh, my testimony. Will mentioned earlier, just a praise from the Lord, but uh, God put on my heart a year ago, uh, what would it look like to plant campuses in prisons all over the country? Uh, guys will re write me letters from time to time from prison and ask if I could come preach, and I'm honored and flattered, but just can't do it, obviously, just with scheduling. But one man sent me a letter this past summer, and it floored me because on the back of the letter were the names of 75 guys who watch Long Hollow every week. And I thought, what would it be like to plant a campus in prisons all over the country? Because uh, the Lord reminded me the only thing between them and me was his grace. And I'm just telling you, it's only the Lord. We just started this three months ago, but right now this service is being broadcast on what's called the Pando app, which is the only certified app to be in prisons. Every prisoner now has a tablet, but in order to have approved things on the tablet, it has to go through the Pando app. So this service is only the Lord. Our, our spring offering went to fund that, and they approved it so, so that this service is gonna be broadcast to 423 prisons all over the country, potentially a million prisoners. Yeah, just only the Lord, it's so cool. So if you're with us, we welcome you today uh, being with us. Uh, a testimony is something every believer has, and if you don't have one, you should have one. It's basically three different sections, right? Like this is, this is who I was before Christ, this is what happened when I met Jesus, and this is what God's done since that day. And so I wanna share with you my story. Now, my story is different than, than probably your story, but the reality is we all, we all should have a testimony, right? And everybody in here, no matter where you are and where you've come from, we are all in the same boat. We desperately need the grace of God in our life, amen? I was thinking about my life. I'll take you back to the beginning when I was a child. If you know my parents, I had really good parents. I was raised in a loving home. My mom and dad uh, made sacrifices to be at every game and sporting event that we had. Uh, my dad, for those who know my dad, he, ha he has two hobbies, that's it. Uh, cars and eating with the family on Saturday nights. And I jokingly say, which is not really a joke, from the time I was seven to the time I was 21, I, ha I have seen every movie made in the 80s and 90s, uh, which is probably why I don't go to the movies much today. I I've seen them all. But every Saturday night was family time, and we went to the movies and to dinner with mom and dad. Uh, I used to work at my dad's shop. He let me work. I started work, I guess you'd call it work, at the age of 12 or 13, and uh, began to work with my dad. My younger sister, Lori started working as well when she was old enough. And Lori and I have been very close, even to this day. Mom and dad and, and Lori drove up from Chattanooga to be here this morning. Uh, but Lori and I were very close. I started to think, why have we been so close? And it's probably because she did whatever I wanted growing up. So thank you, Lori, for that. Uh, she kind of acquiesced to whatever I did. Uh, but dad and I were close too. Uh, my dad uh, is my best friend. Uh, my dad was the best man in my wedding. Uh, Mom and I have been close. Uh, Mom's more like me. Uh, she's pretty driven, and uh, she's always motivated me to be the best person that I could be. 
Uh, mom was actually the religious one. She was the one who brought us to church. And some of you say, well, that's my mom as well. Uh, we were Catholic growing up. I was raised in a Roman Catholic home, but we weren't Christer Catholics, right? Like we didn't go on just Christmas and Easter. We went every Sunday. And if we missed church on Sunday in the Catholic church, you had to go to confession in a booth and confess your sins in order to be back in relationship with God. And so we did that. But for me, even back then, I was thinking, what, what was God to me? I knew who God was, I knew who Jesus was, but God was this overbearing, domineering, distant father who was always out to chastise me every time I got out of line. And believe me, it happened all. Anybody have a view of God growing up like that? And maybe it wasn't a Catholic church, but a Methodist, Presbyterian, even a Baptist church. Uh, I'm here to tell you what I've learned since being a believer for 21 years. The God we serve is nothing like that. He's a loving, compassionate, long-suffering God, amen? I mean, he's just, he's not the things I thought, I thought he was. Uh, I was raised in the 90s with uh, undiagnosed ADHD until they diagnosed me in the 90s. And if you had ADHD in the 90s, they only had one option for you, which was Ritalin. And my parents decided we were gonna go a different route. And so they found this diet online called the, or online, <laughs> uh, at the doctor. <laughs> If they would have been on a lot, I probably wouldn't have been on it, but, uh, but uh, at least I wouldn't. But anyway, it was called the Fine Gold Diet. Anybody familiar with the Fine Gold Diet? Uh, wildly popular back then, if you could tell. Uh, that's a joke. But uh, I was on the Fine Gold Diet. It, it was a diet where there were no preservatives. I couldn't eat any colors or any flavors artificially. Uh, I tell people I didn't chew gum until I was at least 12 years old. Uh, it was actually good for me growing up because I harnessed my sales skills in elementary school as I would take my bland lunch to school in my lunchbox and learn the art of trading cookies and cakes from other students' trays, right? So I would get the cookies and snacks. And what was funny is mom and dad couldn't figure out how Robbie was out of control the last period of school. You know, it was just all the sugar kind of got to me. Uh, I mentioned this before, but uh, I was bullied growing up. Uh, I was tall, obviously taller than than all the kids. I was lanky, uncoordinated, uh, goofy, and and they really bullied me growing up. They'd never pick me for teams, I remember. And some days they would take me behind the school with a few other kids, and they would hold me down on the ground, and they would shove shove clovers in my mouth. And uh, I was thinking, you know, why did I act out so much growing up? You know, I think a part of it was I just wanted someone to accept me. I just wanted someone to approve me and like me and welcome me in. And so I acted out. And the more I acted out, the more I got in trouble. And so in the seventh grade, the principal came to my parents and he said, hey, listen, we don't know what else to do with Robbie. And so my parents sent me out of that school mid-year and enrolled me in an all-boys Catholic high school in New Orleans called Holy Cross High School. It had, a, it had a middle school and high school. And I went in in the middle of the year. And this was a school run by the Catholic brothers wielding paddles for young boys who got out of line. And boy, you learn quick not to get out of line when a brother has a paddle, a priest. And so I kind of got in file and rank at that time. I started to excel at basketball. I love basketball. And when I graduated from college, I received a scholarship to go play at UNC Greensboro, uh, which is in North Carolina. And right before the school started, the girl I was dating uh, who was going to LSU, she said, why are you gonna go that far away? You have to go close to home. And, and I said, okay, and so this is gonna shock some of you young folks, but the older folks will know. I opened what was called a phone book. <laughs> and for those who don't know, it's like, a, it's like a big book with like names and addresses and phone numbers of different places, right? Uh, before Safari and, and Firefox. And so I opened this phone book and I literally find this school named William Carey College in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Has anybody heard of that school? Neither had I. I didn't know anything about the school, right? And I called the coach up and Coach Knight, I said, hey, can I try out for the team? And Coach Knight uh, thought I was crazy. You know, he's like, you're crazy. School's about to start. And he hesitantly let me try out for the team. And I went up with my mom. She would tell you if she was here. We went to that tryout. And I don't know what happened, but it was like Michael Jordan came into my body. I had his reflexes. I'm making every shot. I'm dunking the ball backward. And uh, my mom told me years later, she said, son, I, I want to be honest with you. She said, uh, I've never seen you play that good prior to that tryout. And frankly, you haven't played that good since. But on that day, like, like, like everything worked, you know. And I look back and I look at the sovereign hand of God. God was up to something when I was down to nothing. And as crazy as it is, the coach called me and said, we're going to give you a scholarship to come play basketball. 
Two weeks into the semester, the girl I was dating thought I was cheating on her, which I wasn't, but she breaks up with me. And here I am stuck as a Roman Catholic on the campus of a Southern Baptist college, unbeknownst to me. If you know what that means, I was the target of every evangelism class on campus, right? Like, who do we tell about Jesus? It's Robbie. They had a game on campus called Convert the Catholic. I was the deer in the headlights. And uh, I, I, I didn't hide it, obviously. I would cruise through the campus. My dad had a body shop, so I had an older Porsche she gave me that he fixed up that was totaled. And so I would cruise through the campus my freshman year, blaring the unedited version from Tupac Shakur on two 10-inch bazookas, subwoofers in the trunk. And uh, as I would cruise through the campus, people would try to tell me about Jesus. Uh, I remember even as an unbeliever back then, but something was off. Like even though I didn't know the Lord or even what salvation was or being born again, when they would share Christ, it didn't feel genuine to me. I, I felt like a project for them or a name to put on a blank to send to a convention. And it wasn't until my second year that I met a man, you saw him in the video, by the name of Jeremy Brown. Jeremy Brown did something radical. This is gonna blow your mind. He had a groundbreaking evangelistic strategy. He became my friend. And we realized like we like the same things. We both love basketball. We both love music. We both play guitar. The only difference was he loved Jesus. And Jeremy over time earned the right to share the gospel with me because he was my friend. And I remember one night in that dorm room, he sat me down and he said, hey man, you don't wanna go to hell. And I said, no. And he said, well, repeat this prayer after me, which I did. And I really believed I was a Christian for about two weeks. And the reason uh, I think otherwise, and people have asked me, sure you weren't a believer. The reason I don't think I was born again is because after those two weeks, I went back to the life I had before. And you may be wondering, like, how do I know if my life's changed today? Because you could tell me you're a Christian. I may even believe you. But Jesus gives us a thermometer, a barometer, if you will, to determine if the conversion you profess is genuine. Here's what he said. You could tell a tree by the fruit it what? It bears. And so he said, if you walk in a, in a forest and you see a bunch of trees with leaves, you don't know if it's a pear tree or an apple tree unless it bears fruit, which means that, that the root of our heart is revealed through the fruit of our life. I'll give it to you. This is a saying I've come up with. The fruit of your life reveals the root of your heart. And so think of it this way. If there's no fruit for the Lord, no desire for God, no demonstration of the Spirit, it's probably because there's a bad root or no root at all. And I say this to you with love tonight, but some of you right now are hanging on to a prayer you prayed or an aisle you walked or a decision card you signed years and years ago, maybe as a teenager, maybe as a child, maybe in prison, that you look at years ago and you kind of call back to, but since that time, as you look at the totality of your life, you realize there's no life change. And so the temptation is to, to do better, try harder, or, or stop messing up. I know that was my temptation. But the answer I'm here to tell you, I want you to hear this, the answer is you need to surrender your life completely to Jesus. That's the answer, right? You need to be born again. You need the blood of Jesus to wash away all of your sin. And so I wanna prepare you. In just a few moments, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond. And I don't know where you are or where you've come from or what you've done, but I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond. And I believe that God's gonna do something miraculous in that moment more than any man or woman can manufacture in a lifetime. This morning we saw just hundreds and hundreds of people respond to the message and I'm gonna let you do that by standing up. I'm just gonna ask you in just a few moments to stand up. I know what you're thinking, really stand up in a crowd this size, in a room this big? Yeah, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and here's why. Because Jesus said, if you're ashamed to take a stand for me on this earth, then I'll be ashamed to profess you before my Father and the angels of heaven. Here's the thing, if we can't stand in here, we'll never stand for Christ out there. And so I just want to prepare your heart. In 1998, I graduated from from college and I started a, a computer company with two other guys. The business was great for a season and uh, it wasn't shortly after we had an internal strife and uh, the business dissolved. And so what do you do with a college degree uh, at 21 years old? Uh, I decided to, I wanted to go into the UFC, right? I wanted to be a mixed martial artist. I started to train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I was 
I was doing tournaments uh, at the karate dojo. And uh, at the time, I'm six foot six. Now, you got to remember, this is not UFC today. This is the UFC 1997, 1998, where the guys at the dojo were enrolling in fights where the prize for winning was less than the medical bills at the hospital, okay? Didn't make any sense, but at the time, it, it was perfect sense to me. Uh, I was 6'6", 290 pounds at the time, and the guy, uh, guy out one night, his name was Gino, good Italian name, he sees me at a restaurant with my parents, and he said, hey, would you be interested being the head bouncer of my club downtown New Orleans in the middle of Mardi Gras. I mean, this was the opportunity. I've been waiting my whole, I mean, like, let me get this straight. You're gonna pay me to fight, right? I'm in. And, and that's what I did. I started bouncing for him. And when I tell you, tell you it was the wildest three months of my life, it was. Uh, and I realized I needed to change professions when I was escorting two guys out of the club. Normally we don't escort to the parking lot, but they kept banging on the door. And so my boss had radioed in and said, hey, you gotta bring them to the parking lot. And the whole time I'm escorting them to the parking lot, they're saying things I can't say in church, obviously. And then one guy before they leave leans under his seat and pulls out a loaded nine millimeter gun and points it right at my head and says, now tell me what the, to do. And that got my attention, if you can imagine. I didn't know the Lord, but I thought, okay, I need to make a career change. And so I made a lateral move from bouncing to bartending, right? Like seemed like the right move uh, for my upward progression in life. And uh, I was coming home from work one day. It was November 22nd, 1999. This is where my whole life changed. An 18-wheeler came across two lanes of traffic uh, in New Orleans, if you're familiar, where the high rise meets Metairie. The interstate comes together, which is really kind of a cool insight. The place where the accident happened is a stone store away from the seminary that would change my life. Little did I know, God was up to something when I was down to nothing. 18-wheeler came across two lanes of traffic. I was in his blind spot. He connected with the rear of my Mustang, slammed it into the guardrail. My seatbelt locked, my back torqued, and I herniated two discs in my neck and two discs in my back. I was 22 years old. I was legitimately in pain. And I went to the doctor like you would, and the doctor sent me home with four things. 60 Oxycontin 40s, 60 Valium, 60 Percocet, 60 Soma. And you know the story. I mean, I was legit, like some of you and, and family members, like you go to the doctor in pain, and the very reason you're on the drugs is because you're in pain. And so I start taking them every four to six hours, and eventually I'm addicted to pharmaceutical drugs. I have this insatiable desire to get high, this 30-day prescription is only lasting two weeks, and I've got to find a way to fuel this habit. I couldn't work anymore. Uh, I couldn't train anymore. And so I had to find a way to fuel the drug addiction. So I took the business knowledge from the world, and I brought it into the drug world. And a so-called friend of mine came to me, and he said, hey, wh why are you filling with pharmaceutical drugs when you can buy street drugs? I know a guy in the projects. He'll sell you heroin and cocaine. You can buy it in bulk. You can bag it, sell it, and make money. And so I started selling, uh, started an illegal import business, started selling not only heroin and cocaine, but started selling GHB, uh, marijuana, Special K, which is not a cereal, uh, and, and pharmaceutical pills. And, and I'll tell you that, to, not to impress you, but really to impress upon you how far the Lord had brought me from. Now, I will say this, in the beginning, times were good. I mean, I thought I had everything. I had a red Mustang, I had a third floor apartment, I had a lot of money, I had a lot of respect at the club, but even back then, and if you're in an addiction, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Even back then, when I had everything the world offered, I would put my head on the pillow at night, and inside of me, I started to say to myself, this still small voice would say, there's something greater than this. There has to be more to life than this. If you're in that life right now, you know sin is fun for a season, but it always comes to an end, right? It always does. This is how sin works. I like to say it this way. Sin always takes you further than you wanna go. It costs you more than you wanna pay. And it always keeps you longer than you ever want to stay. When people would come to me and say, man, you need to, your life's a mess. You need to give your life to the Lord. My patent line was this. I have time. What are you talking about? I'm young. Look at me. When I get older... When I'm X of my, I'm only 20 something, I'm only 30 something. I have time, I can wait. You know, that's what my, my friend Rick thought when he died 
New Year's Eve, January 2000, with the needle of heroin still in his arm. And since 2000, from 2000 to 2003, I lost eight friends to drug and alcohol-related deaths, good friends like, like Philip, and Nathan, Brandon, Mike, my closest friend, Ralph. From 2000 till now, it's crazy to think this, but I've actually lost 18 friends uh, who guys I grew up with, guys I used to live with, guys I hung out with. Six of them went to jail. And I say that to, to get you thinking, how many more, if you're in this life now, how many more do you have to lose before God gets your attention? Because the next one could be you, and then what will you do? In 2001, I had a $200 a day heroin and cocaine addiction, and I tried to do the conversion to today, 20-something years later. It'd be about a $350 a day habit that every day I got out of bed, I needed that to live. And you can imagine, I just ran out of money. I didn't know what to do. And so uh, my parents, who were close, and dad, who was a close friend, I went to my dad's wallet, took out his credit card number, and I charged on the family business. My dad had a collision center. I charged $15,000 uh, on the family business, almost bankrupted the family. It'd be about 25, 30,000 today. And I'll never forget the phone call from my mom. My parents found out and mom called me. I still remember it. It was the week before Mardi Gras. And she said, Robbie, we found out about what you did. We cannot believe you stole from us. I'm furious and your father's disappointed in you. Don't you ever come to this house again. You're not welcome here. And in the prideful, arrogant place I was, I said, you know what, mom? I don't need you guys. I never did. I don't need you now. I hung the phone up and I blew the little bit of money I had on drugs and alcohol. And for the next three months, I lived hell on earth. They turned the gas off for three months plus. We live without gas, which means there's no hot water or hot air in winter. And uh, we mastered the art of the cold shower. I still don't even know how we did this. We'd get in the freezing cold water, We'd get out, we'd lather, we'd get back into the freezing cold water. And I did that for over three months because I was more interested in getting high than paying the bills. We lived without electricity for a month by candlelight. We lived without gas, water. Eventually they uh, turned the phone off, the bill collectors couldn't call. And I was at the bottom uh, of the barrel in life. And I just wanna pull over for a moment because I've thought about this a lot. Whenever you see a perpetual drug addiction, a, a drug or an alcohol, and, and I don't talk about alcohol much because I, I've always been an alcoholic at that time since I was 16. That was part and parcel to the culture of New Orleans. I was always an alcoholic. So alcohol was just the baseline. But with alcohol or drugs, any addiction, here's how it works. Normally, a perpetual addiction is continued because of the result of an enabler, okay? Normally it's a mom or a dad, but it could be an uncle or an aunt. It could be a sister or a brother. It could be a son or a daughter. And if you're that enabler, listen to me, you're not doing it because you wanna hurt the person. You're doing it because you love them. But the reality is your love will actually, your help will actually kill them because there's only three outs to a drug addiction or alcohol abuse, jail, institutions, or death. It was the tough love of my mom and dad that actually saved my life. And so I've come up with a line to kind of help you think about it. And I want you to process this. Here's the line. If you keep, and I'm speaking to you if you're an enabler, if you keep being their savior, Jesus never can be. Like, why would I turn to Christ when I, when I have mom? Why would I turn to God when I have dad? And so mom and dad created the bottom for me. And I finally gave in. I went to my parents' house, and by the grace of God, they were very gracious to me. They were not believers at the time, but my unbelieving parents demonstrated God's love to me in a way I've never forgotten. They took me into rehab. I said, Mom and Dad, I'm a drug addict, and I need help. And immediately, they took me in. Within three days, I was on a plane with my mom to, of all places, Tijuana, Mexico. And we laughed about that this week. A drug addict... Uh, you know, in a bad position, and a five foot four blonde head woman. We're gonna fly to Tijuana together, you know, for rehab. And the reason we went there is because it wasn't approved in the States. Now it is, but back then it wasn't. And for 10 days, my life changed. It put me one year ahead in my sobriety. The doctor told me coming back, he said, you cannot return to the people, places, and things that you were engaged in before. Do you know someone out of that environment you could live with? Well, I only knew one person. 
and that was my sister, Lori. She was a student at South Alabama in Mobile, and uh, I moved in with her. She was very gracious to let me move in. And I always look back to those days. God has a sense of humor. I went from this successful by the world standards, money, partying, rapport, respect in the club, to God let me live in a one bedroom apartment on a blow up mattress with my sister, right? God has a sense of humor. I got a job at a gym and for about seven, eight months, I was doing really good. I was clean, I was sober. In the middle of working out one day, which was a dumb decision, I was squatting way too much weight. And when I went to push back up, I heard my back pop and I was in pain again. And so, but this time I, I'm, I'm on this side of recovery, so I know how to beat it. I'm not a drug addict anymore, so I know what I'll do. I decide, I had this great idea, that I would drive back to New Orleans to see the same doctor to give me the same pills, but this time I'm not gonna use them all. I'll sell most of the pills for Christmas presents, and I'll just have a few on hand, right? And you know the story. I, I went back to the, to the doctor. I remember sitting in the parking lot of the pharmacy, and when I popped that first bottle of pills of Oxy's, the cycle repeated itself again. This is how addiction works, just to kind of bring you into the mind of an addict. When you relapse on drugs or anybody, you don't start over from the beginning. Do you know that? You actually pick up where you left off. And that's the reason people die when they relapse. You hear somebody with 20, 30 years sobriety and they relapse and they die immediately. Why? Because they pick up where they left off. Think of it this way, it's like a train. The moment you start an addiction, the train leaves the station with you on it. It's going at a furious pace. By God's grace, some of you get off the train along the way. And in just a few moments, we baptized people this morning, which was unbelievable. I think we baptized about 27 people today. This morning was unbelievable. And then one tonight. But I met three to four different people in the tank that said, hey, I've been an addict most of my adult life. I've never experienced sobriety, but I heard your story, I resonated with it, it gave me hope, and today I'm leaving drugs and alcohol and I'm trusting Jesus for sobriety. Some of you are gonna experience that tonight. Well, let's, let's, let me show you how it happens. When the train goes, you get off the train. You stop moving with the addiction, but the addiction never stops. So the train keeps going. And when you relapse, you pick up back where the train is, but this time it's further than the tra down the track. And so I picked up where I left off back to a 200 plus dollar a day addiction. 2002, I went under the knife, I had surgery on my back, and I picked back up with this addiction of heroin and cocaine again. There's only one picture I have of my life prior to coming to Christ. We lost them all in, in Hurricane Katrina. But this is an image of me six months before coming to Christ. Now when people see that picture by itself, they think that's an induction prison to go to the jail. I would love to say that. No, but that's me at the DMV. This is everyday Robbie right here. And I want you to see something. Look at the countenance on his face. This is a hollow shell of a man. I readmitted myself back into rehab for the second time and two weeks after being sober, I, I came home one day and I remembered what Jeremy Brown told me seven years before in that dorm room of college. It's November 12, 2002. And literally, here's what I thought. I didn't know much about the Lord, but here's what I thought. I thought, I might as well give Jesus a try. I've tried everything else and I've lost so many friends. What do I have to lose? This is what I thought in my mind. And I took the little bit of Christ that I knew of and I, took, I put it in the little bit of faith that I had and thank God it was enough to be radically saved, amen? Aren't you grateful that God saves us and meets us right where we are, right? And my life changed. I mean, right away, my life was transformed. And the Lord started using me right away. I, I, I knew this, and this doesn't happen often, but I knew that the Lord was gonna use me in some form or fashion to speak for him as a preacher. Uh, you can imagine that day after when I went to my dad sitting in the recliner who has no category for this, and I said, Dad, uh, God saved me, and, and by the way, he's called me to preach. And he looks up and, and he says, what are, you, what are you smoking, son? I thought you just got back you know, from Rhea. He didn't even have a category for that, and I didn't either. Uh, I started to preach. I mean, a month and a half later, God opened the door for me. I went to the Brantley Center, which is a homeless shelter in New Orleans, and uh, God opened the door for me to preach that day. There was about 75 people in the room, and I gave my testimony, kind of a shortened version, and I shared a, a message from the Word, and I gave an invitation to those who were there. And that day, seven people stood up 
And they said, we want to know the same Jesus you know. And I didn't know what God was doing, but that was a confirmation in my heart. God's presence was felt in a palpable way, and God began to show me, this is what you're going to do the rest of your life. I didn't know anybody who was a Christian but one guy. I knew one Christian. It was Jeremy Brown, the guy who told me about Christ. And so the Lord put in my heart, you're going to start a ministry with Jeremy traveling around the country. I called Jeremy up out of the blue, and I said, Jeremy, it's Robbie. I'm saved, and God told me we're going into ministry. Who is this again? <laughs> I said, it's Robbie. And he said, well, God didn't tell me that. And I said, well, when he does, call me back and let me know, right? Uh, and we started the ministry in 2003. We came up with a really innovative name. We called it Galilee and Brown Ministries, right? Uh, I didn't know how to preach. You're probably saying, what are you doing preaching? I didn't know how to preach, but I knew how to do card tricks, magic tricks back then. And uh, I realized that student ministries loved card tricks and illusions. And so I would travel around with Jeremy and I would preach. We decided to take some pictures. These are some pictures from when we started our ministry. Uh, I didn't know how to preach, but I knew tricks. And apparently I knew how to dress like the rock. So, <laughs> but we started traveling. God began to use us. We, we preached in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama. We even went to New York. And in March of that year, a few months after being a Christian, I decided I was invincible. Like I'm a preacher, I need to go back and save my friends in the drug world, and that's what I did. I had two close friends, Eloy and Brandon. And sadly, as I think back to those two guys, they did not accept the gospel, and sadly, both of, them got, both of those guys are dead uh, from addiction. But I went back to one of them and I said, hey, let me tell you what God's doing in my life. Do you mind? And they said, no. One of them said, no, I don't mind. Do you mind if I roll a joint while you do it? And I said, no, what are you talking about? I'm a Christian preacher. I'm not gonna stumble. And I don't even know how it happened, to be honest with you, but I just remember two weeks later after sharing Christ with him, I'm walking on Bourbon Street. I've got a Bud Ice in my right hand and I've got an eight ball of cocaine in my left pocket and we're going back to Eloy's apartment in Jackson Square to get high as a Christian preacher. And I'm even hesitant even talking about this part of my life because if it wasn't for the grace of God and the mercy of God, I shouldn't even be here. And within two weeks, I'm back on drugs again, remember, I'm picking up where I left off, and this time I have a car accident that resulted in a lawsuit, and so I have money now, and I blew through that two-month period from March to May, I blew over $28,000 on drugs and alcohol. Every morning, my same routine was I'd wake up around 10.30 or 11. I'd drive to the daiquiri shop before I would go into the city and score drugs. The, I don't know if you know, but in New Orleans, they, there are 24-hour liquor stores where you can drive through, and uh, I would get a daiquiri. Now, a daiquiri is like a slushy with alcohol, for those who don't know, and I would drive through the, the daiquiri shop, and, but I'm a preacher, remember, so I'm sharing the gospel with the girl who's working. Her name was Christy, and so I'd go order the strongest drink at 10, 30, 11 in the morning. Yeah, I'd like the 180 90 octane. Oh, by the way, I want a jumbo, and do you know the Bible says that if you confess, oh, I'm sorry, 450, sorry. Do you know if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart Jesus was Ray, you'll be saved. And I did this for a couple weeks and months. And I remember one day she leans out the window and here's what's cool about the Lord. He uses a non-believing, atheist, pot-smoking, non-religious person to bring me back to Jesus. She leans out the window when she hands my drink to me and she says, Robbie, you know, for someone who knows so much about Jesus, you sure don't act like it. Wow. Wow. And in the process of leading her to Christ, which God was gracious to do, it brought me back to him. And God showed me a valuable lesson I want you to see. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter all of the things you've done for God. It doesn't matter the kind of testimony you have. We can lose it all in a moment, right? What took a lifetime to build can be lost in a moment. And I'm so grateful for that lesson because God showed me you have to have parameters. You have to have safeguards which Candy and I have to this day. By the grace of God, I've been sober, clean and sober now for 21 years in May. And I just thank the Lord, yeah, for that. Shortly after uh, the, the treatment for the second time and surrendering my life to Christ, I was able to pay my parents back all the money I stole from them. 
God opened a door for me to go to seminary. I didn't like school the first time. He said, we'll give it another chance, right? Uh, I didn't, I didn't want to go back to seminary. Uh, but when I started seminary two months in, I met this young girl named Candace Ross, uh, who uh, we had a mutual friend that was very persistent in trying to connect us. Both of us had been through a lot of relationships, but decided to stay single. But the girl I went to Carry with, William Carey, she heard about me preaching of all places at Jeremy Brown's church. And uh, she brought candy to what I tell people was, uh, was a blind preaching date, right? And if you don't know what that means, I'll, I'll say uh, it was the best sermon I've ever preached in my life uh, because it worked. So candy stayed with, no, I'll play it. It was bad. It was really bad. But Candy was gracious, and uh, I proposed to her five months later, and we got married in 10 months. And I'm, I'm telling you, when I met Candy, she was unlike any girl that I had ever met before in my life. Not only was she a good girl, but she was someone who loved Jesus as much or more than I. And not only is she beautiful on the outside, but Candy is beautiful on the inside, and she has motivated me. Baby, thank you for being a better husband and a better father, and a better pastor because of you. So thank you. After, yeah. I went to school for eight years straight. Uh, and, uh, but this time it was different, you know, because I, I knew I was there to learn about God. And so I was passionate about studying. And of all things, I got out with three degrees, uh, one of which was a preaching, uh, a PhD in preaching. Uh, which was surprising to my parents and myself as they went. You can imagine, they were blown away by the graduation as I was because at one point my parents thought they were gonna raise me for the rest of their life. The thing I'm proudest of the most is the fact that I'm the proud father of two amazing boys named Rig and Ryder, who I have the privilege every Wednesday night of discipling in my home. But the greatest gift of all, and I've been gifted with a lot of things from the Lord, is that I've been able to return the gift of salvation to the two people that gave it to me when I needed it the most, my parents. And I got to return them something way better than sobriety. I got to return to them the message of Jesus Christ. I shared the gospel with my mom, my dad, and my sister, and they accepted Christ, and I had the opportunity in 2010 to baptize my mom, my dad, and my sister. They're all believers today by the grace of God. To say God has been good to me is, is really an understatement. You know, people ask me, what, what was it, Robbie, that did it for you? How do you know you weren't saved in the beginning? How do you know your life was changed in your room? And I've thought about this a lot. What did it for me in that, in that room, November 12, 2000? Two was four things. I understood, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. These are the four things that I finally understood that led me to salvation and transformation. Number one is this. I understood for the first time who God was. Now, I'd known God. I went to a Catholic school. I went to a Christian college, but I didn't know God. Like I knew who God was, was the one who created the universe, the stars in the sky, put the planets in place. Uh, God was the one who created human beings, you and me. But for the first time I realized because God created me and you, listen to me, I was gonna give an account to that God for everything I had done. And that's what's gonna happen. When you die, you're gonna stand before the God of the universe and you're gonna give an account for everything, every motive, action, thought, or deed you've ever done. The second thing I understood was that I had a sin problem that I needed to do something about. Like I really understood the magnitude of my sin. Now I'd learned like you about Adam and Eve in the garden and how they ate of the tree that God said don't eat of. And I knew because they ate of that tree, they were separated from God. It was rebellion against God. The Bible calls it sin. And here's the way to think of it. Anything that we are disobedient to God's command in word, deed, or action, the Bible labels a sin. I know what you're thinking. Well, I don't have a story like you. Well, you may not have a story like me. I didn't do those things you did. I didn't sin like that. Whether you sin one time or 10,000 times, the Bible said it's sin. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned, you know this verse, and fallen short of the glory of God. You're gonna be blown away by this. Guess what the word all means in Greek? Do you know? It means all, right? Like everybody Everybody's sin, right? Romans 3.10, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one seeks after God. And so the sin of Adam in the garden, follow me, was not only disastrous for the first couple, 
but it affected the entire human race, you and me. And, I, and I'll prove it to you, like, like you're dealing with this too. Have you ever told a lie before? Anybody? Uh, uh, raise your hand, big lie, white lie, little lie. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying, so. <laughs> but we all have, right? Like, like every one of us has told a lie. Have you ever stolen anything before? Change off a dresser, answers off a test. We all have. Have you ever coveted something, or, or this way, have you ever lusted after someone other than your spouse, another woman or another man? If you answered yes to one of those or all three of those, by your own admission, you are, according to Jesus, a thieving, lying adulterer. And so you have a sin problem like me. And I knew from Romans 3, 6.23 that the wages or the price of sin is death. The price we're gonna pay for sin is death or separation from God. Number three, here's what did it for me. I understood for the first time who Jesus was and I knew that Jesus was my only hope. And he's your only hope as well, by the way. And you know about Jesus. You were raised in Middle Tennessee or you're, you're in a free country like America. But, but let me just share with you what I understood in that, in that room that day. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was fully man and fully God, but he was unlike me in that he was perfect in every sense of the word. He never committed one impure thought, motive, action, or deed. He was perfect. But the people Jesus came to save, the ones he came to bring salvation to, rejected him. His own people didn't want him. They actually sent him to a cross and crucified him. And as Jesus Christ hung on the cross that day, the Bible says darkness would cover the land. And the darkness we know from scripture signified, watch this, the wrath of God that was reserved for you and me being placed squarely upon the head and the back of his son. So you gotta realize this. You and I should have died that day. It was our sin, not his. We did everything wrong. He did nothing wrong, and Jesus took upon our sin. But the story didn't end there, and I finally realized what the resurrection was about. Not only did he die on a cross, but he went into a grave. But he will conquer that grave and rise from the dead. The Bible says for 40 days appear to people, 500 in total. And then after that, he would ascend to heaven to be at the right hand of the Father where he sits today on the throne of God to judge the living and the dead, the righteous and the unrighteous. See, here's how you have to think of it. It's very simple. Every person in this world, every person created by God, every person accountable to God, is going to bow the knee to him one day. Here's the thing. Today, this is the good news. You and I have an opportunity to willingly bow the knee to Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life. But you may not wanna do that, and that's your right. You may say, I don't wanna bow the knee to Jesus. The Bible is clear though. One day when he returns, every person will bow the knee to him, not as Lord and Savior, but as judge and sentencer. And so I knew, and if I'm in there, that wouldn't be the whole story. I knew this, and this is what did it for me. The urgency that I needed to make a decision today, not tomorrow, today. And I knew, when I knew all of that of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I had two choices. I could do it my way, or I could do it God's way. And I'd done it my way, and I knew how that turned out. My way was rejecting God, running my own life, calling my own shots, doing it the way I wanted. And God said, you can have it that way, but you're gonna face judgment, condemnation, and you're gonna live a wasted, hopeless life. And the reason I say wasted is a life apart from the one who created you is always a life that never understands why they're here and what they're called to do. But the good news is I knew I could do it God's way, which was simply repenting. Repenting is acknowledging that you've done some things wrong and you can't fix yourself. Only God can. And when you surrender your life to Christ and accept the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ through faith, here's what he does. He forgives all your sin. He wipes your slate clean. He fills you with his spirit. He grants you a spot in heaven. Watch this. And he begins, and this is what you need to hear. He begins to fight your battles for you and with you and alongside of you, amen? Because I was not good at fighting my battles. I always lose. I would always fail. Now, everyone in here has a choice to make, and, and here's the choice today, and everyone has to make a choice. Either you're gonna accept the free gift and receive the free gift of salvation, or you're gonna stiff arm and reject the gift of God. I know what you're thinking. Some of you are saying, hey, but, but I'm not ready to make a decision. I didn't come here to make a decision, Pastor Robbie. I came here to hear a story about a man. 
I'm just here for the testimony. I get that. But brother or sister, to not make a decision is to make a decision. And that decision is to reject God. I want you to know if you're in an addiction right now of any kind, you cannot overcome the addiction separate and apart from Jesus. Sobriety without Christ is always a dead end street. Believe me, I've lived on that street for a long time. But Jesus says, if you surrender to me, I will fight with you and go before you. And so I wanna give you an opportunity to respond to that message today. Now, I know what you're thinking, but I'm not ready to give my life. I need to clean my life up. Like, give me some time. I used to say this all the time. Let me clean my life up, and then I'll surrender to Christ. You ever heard that before? I would ask you, if you're saying that today, when do you go to the doctor? When you're well or when you're sick? Like, you never go when you're well. You go when you're sick. You go just as you are, and you let the doctor clean you up, make you well. Here's what my invitation is to you tonight. I'm gonna ask you to give your life to the great physician who says, come to me, anyone who is overwhelmed, anyone who is burnt out, beat down, overwhelmed, and I will give you rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me clean you up. And so I wanna pray over you and I wanna, I wanna pray with you. So as we close, would you just bow your head for just a moment? And I don't know where you are, and I don't need to know, because God knows. And so I, I wanna ask you now, and I told you this before, I was gonna ask you to respond by simply standing. And the reason I'm asking you to stand is to show that you're unashamed. You're not ashamed to take a stand to follow Jesus. So I'm gonna ask you to stand in just a moment, and, then, and you're standing, you're saying, hey, I'm surrendering my life to Christ. Listen, I'm not asking you to say a prayer, I'm not asking if you signed a card, I'm not asking you to join a church or a denomination. I'm asking you to give your life to Jesus once and for all, and watch what God can do. I'm living proof that God can take a mess and turn it into a message. God could do more in this moment than any man or woman can manufacture in your life for a lifetime. And so I'm gonna ask you right now, if that's you, and we already have many standing, I'm gonna ask you right now, would you just stand right to your feet without saying a word? And in your standing, you're saying, Jesus, I wanna change. I wanna surrender my life to you. I need your help. Praise God. Thank you, sister. It's been a long time coming for some of you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Praise God. Just right where you are, just stand. Thank you, sister. Anyone else? Maybe you're in high school or, or middle school. Maybe you're a senior adult. Maybe you're a single mom, single dad. You're saying, hey, I've done it for far too long on my own. I need God to, to fight with me and alongside of me and, and live in me. Praise God, thank you. Just a moment longer, just right where you are, just stand to your feet. And here's what I'm asking you to stand. You may not get another moment like this. I want you to think back to the last time you heard the voice of God, you felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit. If you're in here thinking, man, I wish this pastor would be quiet so we can leave, then God's probably talking to you. So I'm gonna ask you to stand right now, just right where you are. Pastor Ravi, would you pray for me? And I'm gonna pray over you. I'm gonna pray that the same power that God gave to me and on me in that room 21 years ago would be bestowed upon you personally and individually right now. Thank you, little brother. Anyone else? Just right where you are. Just stand right where you are. Pastor, pray for me. If you're standing, no one else but those standing, look at me for a moment. Just those standing, look at me for just a moment. This is a big deal in your life. And I want you to know, I'm not asking you to do anything that someone not long ago on a stage like this asked me to do when I was in a seat like yours. And I'm just telling you, today is the beginning of the rest of your life. And we're gonna believe and, and, and pray that God's gonna do something so amazing that the lightness and the heaviness and the load's gonna be removed from you and you're gonna leave this place differently. So here's what I wanna do. And I know this is asking a lot, but I wanna pray over you personally. We're gonna have a song or two after so you'll have time to come back. So brother and sister, would you come? I'm gonna actually pray alongside of you. I'm gonna bow down with you. Would you come and just bow down before the Lord and I'm just gonna pray a prayer of blessing over your life. And so sister, you come, praise God. Sister, would you come? If you're in the balcony, you come. I promise you, they will let you out the, the row. In fact, they will clap for you as you're coming. I promise you, because this is a big day for you. It's a big day for us. 
Yeah, praise God. You come. You come. Yeah, praise the Lord. Let's thank the Lord. And if you need to come and you haven't come already, then we're going to celebrate with you. You come. If you're in the balcony, praise God. Just make your way down here and we're going to pray together. You know, there's something about publicly standing or stepping out for God. If you study the scripture, you know nobody that experienced the miracle ever did it privately, secretly. Never. In fact, a woman literally got on her hands and knees just to touch the hem of the garment one time. Bartimaeus cried out and like, be quiet, man. We don't have any time for you. Shut up, be quiet. And he said, no, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Every person who experienced the miraculous did it publicly. And I think there's just something about this. So this is going to be a spiritual marker in your life tonight. Praise God. People are still coming. Yeah. If you need to come, yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you need to come, just come. Praise God. Hey, hey, I want you to know there's nothing supernatural about this prayer, but there is something significant about the God we're going to pray to. And we're going to pray over these men and women. Would you do me a favor? Would you just extend a hand? And we're going to ask the Lord's covering and blessing upon these men and women. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. It's all about him. This is not a story about me or a man. This is not about a church. This is not about a music ministry. It's not about songs we sing. It's about the person we sing to. And I'm asking God, I'm gonna boldly ask that you would set these men and women free from whatever it is in their life that plagues them. God, I'm asking as they repent to you and confess that they can't do it any longer on their own. That Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. And I'm asking you, would you invade their life? Would you take up residence in their heart? And would you set them free once and for all? For, for, the, for the Lord, you say, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And when the Son sets you free, we're believing you are free indeed. And so God, let freedom reign and ring in this place today. Show us today we're no longer slaves. We are sons and daughters of a king. And our home is heaven. And so God, I'm, I'm thankful for the courage to come today. And we're praying that these men and women leave this place different than the way they came in, that they would literally be changed today. We love you, Lord. We ask it in the only name we know how. And that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. Hey, I want to speak to you before you go. For Yeah, well, let's praise the Lord. Amen. Before you go back, I just want to speak to you for a moment. Um, the, the, one, the one lie that Satan would love to whisper in your ear, because I, I, I know that voice because I hear it from time to time, is you can do this on your own. You've got this. You don't need any help. That's a lie from Satan. And I want to give you something to help you. We're here to help you, obviously, but I want to give you something to help you. I wrote a book years ago about my life. It's called Recovered. In the book, actually, obviously, it's an expanded version of my life, but in the back of the book, this is what I want to give you. There are eight steps that I lay out that help me experience sobriety and victory. I want to give that to you as a gift. That's going to be our gift to you. So before we leave, we have two songs. I promise you can come back. So I want you to stand for a moment. If you just make your way to the Next Steps area, we want to pray with you and encourage you. We want to give you the copy of that resource to help you walk the Christian life. So would you just make your way, and then you can go back. Hey, let's stand our feet. We're going to praise the Lord for what God's doing tonight. Amen. Let's thank God for what he's doing. We're going to sing tonight. And uh, here's what I want to challenge you to think about. I know some of us in here would say, Pastor, I love to hear your story, but my story didn't turn out like that. My son or my daughter, or my husband, or my wife didn't make it. And we heard this morning from, from people just came and wept in the line and just said, my brother's gone, my, my son's gone. Here's what I want you to know. We have grief sh share and grief counselors here to walk with you and pray with you to journey along uh, this journey together with you tonight by yourself. Also tomorrow, we have something at Long Hollow called Celebrate Recovery. It's a ministry I wish I had years ago. I didn't know about it, but we have it here at Long Hollow. Tomorrow night at 6.30. Oh, by the way, I just found out Danny Spano, our recovery pastor, sharing his testimony tomorrow. So you can go here, Danny. I never heard it in its entirety, so I'm looking for it. Tomorrow night I'll be there at 6.30. I want you to join me. And I know you're probably saying, I don't want to come out and say I need to be here. I kind of feel nervous or anxious what people may think. If anyone asks you, just say, pastor asked me to go. I'm just going because Robbie's here, right? You can hide. That's a joke. But you can hide that way, right? I'm just here because Robbie. But I want you to go. 
It'll be life-changing and life-giving for you, I promise. And so let's sing. We got a lot to sing about and worship the Lord. These steps are open for you. If you wanna pray, maybe the name of someone comes to mind who's not here and needs Jesus, you wanna lift them up to the Lord as the Lord leads, you respond. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear For I am a child I'm no longer a slave to fear For I am a child of God Thank you, Jesus From my mother's womb You have chosen me
Come on, the Lord is good, amen? We celebrate the fact that we've just seen people go from death to life. Come on, can we celebrate that? Hey, I wanna thank my friend, Hidden Kerr and her husband, Jason, for being here with us uh, this morning and tonight. She wrote a song um, that I feel like is just a a great exclamation mark um, for what Robbie's talked about and what we've been singing about. And so, can we sing this song? Come on, let's leave this. to the bottom I've been to the edge and I've been down that road that led to failure and regret oh but I've been to the one who wrote his love for me in red and I've been changed I've been hearing voices that sound a lot like shame they try to keep me But they're talking to the old me And I don't answer to that name Cause I've been changed He changed my weeping to rejoicing My guilty and grace to somebody about what it means to surrender your life to Jesus. We would love to have the opportunity to connect with you. It is so easy to connect. All you need to do is get out your phone and text the word NEXT to the number 98173, or you can scan that QR code. And this week we'll be reaching out to you and we cannot wait to have any type conversation with you that you need to have. Now, if you're watching with a group of people, maybe you have a host. I know that person would love to have a conversation with you uh, about Jesus. And as always, we're a resource and all you have to do is text next. So at the beginning of service, we talked a little bit about a ministry here at Long Hollow called Celebrate 
recovery. If you're joining us right now online and you live locally, man, we would love to see you tomorrow night at CR. Pastor's going to be there. You can find all the information by scanning that code or texting CR to 98173. But if you're joining us from somewhere outside of our local area and you're interested in finding a Celebrate Recovery near you, you can also text CR to 98173. And once you scroll to the bottom, you'll actually see a Celebrate Recovery locator where you just put in your area and it will give you all the closest Celebrate Recoveries right where you are. Again, we're so thankful you joined us tonight and we hope to see you next week.